Better Call Saul is an immoral world. It's rare that characters do the right thing, and it's even rarer that characters are considered good people. And that's what makes Kim Wexler so interesting. While she's somewhat of a moral compass for our other protagonist, Jimmy McGill, she often enables and even encourages the worst of Jimmy. She's definitely a strong, independent woman, but not to the point that it becomes a trope. There's no doubt in my mind that Kim could have her own standalone show, and there's even an argument to be made that she's the most complex character in the show. But what truly sets Kim Wexler apart from other television characters is her morality, or lack thereof. As Kim's presented as a primary protagonist, one would assume that she's a good guy, but it's not that simple. Simply being a protagonist doesn't constitute a character to be a hero. It's not that easy. It's never a question of who's a hero and who's a villain, but rather why does a character act this way? Is it something from their past motivating their actions, or is it something in the present dictating their motivations? While Better Call Saul is labeled as a crime and legal drama, most of its entertainment value actually comes from the relationships between characters, from the complexities and motivations of our characters. Better Call Saul is not black and white television and neither is Kim Wexler. She definitely has strong morals and good intentions, often going out of her way to do the right thing, but what else? See, that's just the surface level and under that is something much darker, something much worse. So who exactly is Kim Wexler? Not much is known about Kim's past. Throughout the entirety of Better Call Saul, we're shown only two scenes of her past, but these scenes are vital to understanding Kim. In the first, Kim is seen waiting outside in the freezing cold for her mom to come pick her up. It's unclear how long she's been waiting, but we can tell it's been a while. Eventually, her mom comes to finally pick her up, defending herself, explaining how she got held up at a bar. A young but still wise Kim realizes this means she's drunk, likely common behavior from her mom. Instead of getting in the car, Kim decides to walk three miles with a cello on her back in the freezing Nebraska cold. From this scene, we come to understand Kim's independent nature. Her mother was likely unreliable, so she's had to do a lot for herself. Her mother repeatedly lets down her child, yet Kim still believes in her. Kim still cleans up her mess. Despite being repeatedly let down time and time again, Kim holds hope that bad people can change. This early characterization of Kim are traits that follow her throughout the entire show, most prominently in her relationship with Jimmy, of course, but also in her job and in her clients. These traits define Kim Wexler. They define her motivations and her actions throughout all of Better Call Saul but especially in her relationship with Jimmy. Initially, Kim and Jimmy's relationship is presented as relatively platonic, just two lawyer friends contributing to each other's success. Kim, a hardworking but not yet established lawyer, is working her way up the ranks of HHM, and Jimmy, well, he's Jimmy. But at least for now, they're just friends. And as Jimmy's friend, Kim sees through his plots. She understands the good intention behind them, but also realizes that Jimmy isn't playing by the rules. He's cutting corners to get ahead, and Kim doesn't approve, but she doesn't stop him. When Jimmy denies the job offer, from Davis and Maine, Kim confronts him, asking him how he could deny a job that he's been working for his entire life. He defends himself, saying that he doesn't need to make Chuck proud anymore, so he doesn't need the job. But at the resort, they meet a salesman, and Jimmy's able to convince a reluctant Kim to con him. And this is Kim's first con, at least with Jimmy. She plays along and they steal a pretty expensive bottle from the guy, but the main takeaway is Kim's enjoyment. At first, she was pretty reluctant to take advantage of a relatively innocent man, but as they get further and further into the con, Kim gets more comfortable exploiting this man. She steals what is likely hundreds if not a thousand dollars from someone they've never met and immediately leaves with Jimmy laughing and clearly enjoying herself. This is a harsh contrast to what the ordinary Kim is like. And as soon as they scam someone together, we see what is essentially the start of their relationship. And this is some phenomenal foreshadowing and characterization. Later, Jimmy accepts the Davison main offer, and of course, he continues his usual chicanery. He solicits an entire bus full of Sandpiper residents, convincing them to join the Sandpiper case, which is illegal. And when the Sandpiper group meets to discuss their progress, both Chuck and Kim are skeptical of Jimmy's methods. Kim stops playing footsie with Jimmy, and promptly reminds him that she risks her job and reputation for Jimmy. So when Jimmy gets himself fired, he hurts Kim. He hurts her reputation and career. She gets put in doc review because Jimmy did what he wanted. He did what was best for him without thinking how it would affect Kim. He wanted to keep his bonus, and in the process, he ended up screwing Kim over. But this is Kim Wexler we're talking about. Of course, she has a plan to get out, and she's gonna do it by herself. So, she does what she does best. Puts her head down and just works. She takes every opportunity she can to try and land a big client. On a stairwell, hell, even in the bathroom, it doesn't matter. Kim wants to succeed, no, she needs to succeed. And soon enough, she lands Mesa Verde. But there's just one issue. Jimmy getting himself fired reflected poorly on Kim, sure. But Kim convinced Howard to push her Jimmy, which meant Jimmy getting himself fired reflected even worse on Howard. It's clear to Kim that she likely won't be moving up the ranks at HHM anymore, so when Jimmy asks Kim if they want to practice law together, she accepts. But only under one condition. She needs Jimmy to play it straight. He needs to dot every I and cross every T. But of course, Jimmy wants to be colorful. 
Kim was only able to successfully quit HHM because Jimmy sabotaged Chuck and Mesa Verde. Of course, Kim doesn't know this yet, but nonetheless, she quits HHM and works with Jimmy. And Chuck, he's furious. That was his client. He earned it. He convinced Mesa Verde to sign with HHM, and they only went with Kim because of Jimmy, because of his scheming brother. So Chuck confronts Jimmy and tells Kim the truth. He tells Kim that Jimmy swapped the Mesa Verde address, sabotaging Chuck in court, and causing Mesa Verde to leave HHM and sign with Kim. And this is where Kim Webster's hidden evil starts to reveal itself. Kim defends Jimmy, telling Chuck that he made a mistake, but she doesn't just defend the Mesa Verde scheme, she defends all of Jimmy. Every scheme, every plot, she puts all the blame on Chuck, whether justifiably so or not. She tells him Jimmy's done everything he's done to make Chuck proud, and all Chuck has ever done is try to tear his brother down. All that Chuck has done was enable Jimmy's schemes and exploits. All Chuck has done was ruin his brother. Now whether or not you think this rant was justified or not is up to you, but no matter what, to some degree, it was wrong. Kim knew Chuck was right, this is evident by her immediately punching Jimmy after talking to Chuck. She knew Jimmy had illegally swapped those numbers and committed a felony, but she still defended him. And yes, her defense of Jimmy can be attributed to her love for him, but it's not just love motivating her. After the rant, when Kim and Jimmy are laying in bed, she tells Jimmy that he needs to cover his tracks. He needs to protect himself and make sure he won't get in trouble for the crime he committed. By helping Jimmy cover up committing a felony, Kim is undoubtedly blurring her morality. Of course, she's not happy about what Jimmy did, but she's still helping him cover it up. And when Jimmy's arrested for breaking into Chuck's house to destroy his taped confession, Kim agrees to help Jimmy. As Chuck is gunning for Jimmy's disbarment, Kim and Jimmy develop a plan to not only save Jimmy, but completely tear Chuck down. Kim is always defending Jimmy and his actions, no matter how bad they are. Whether it's ruining his own brother or ruining Howard, Kim is always defending Jimmy. And yeah, it can be attributed to her love for him, but it's not just that. She enjoys the schemes, she enjoys the plots, just like Jimmy does, but in a different way. She enjoys the power she feels after, and she enjoys the superiority she feels over others, but most importantly, she absolutely loves the success that comes with it because that's just what Kim Wexler is. In season 3 chicanery, Kim further disassociates herself with what's right and what's wrong. Throughout the entirety of the episode, their main objective is to tear down Chuck, a man who was essentially ruined by mental illness. Although you could argue Chuck deserved it, or that Kim and Jimmy tore him down out of necessity, it still doesn't change the fact that it was wrong. And that's common throughout Better Call Saul, but especially with Kim. So to protect Jimmy, they tear down Chuck. They ruin his career and reputation, and Kim knows it was wrong. She expresses his guilt later when she tells Jimmy, As far as I'm concerned, all we did all we did was tear down a sick man. And this is what makes Kim's morality so tragic. She understands what she's doing is wrong, and she wants to stop and do the right thing, but she doesn't. She generally fights against her impulses, but ultimately gives in. And this causes an unimaginable amount of guilt and stress, especially with Chuck. Jimmy won't be a lawyer for a year, so Kim takes on extra work to try and make ends meet. Chuck has been completely and utterly ruined, due in part to himself and his self-destructive nature, but Kim had a huge role in destroying Chuck. This causes guilt. Guilt that Kim tries to suppress through her work. She takes on a new client working herself to extreme levels of exhaustion, and then she crashes. This scene is vital for Kim. From this crash, she realizes how unfulfilling her work with Mesa Verde has been. She comes to understand she doesn't want to spend the rest of her life helping a mid-sized Albuquerque bank grow. She wants to do something more meaningful. She wants to help others. So she takes on PD Overflow. And even better, she joins Schweikert and Coakley so she can keep Mesa Verde and also work on her pro bono cases. So happy ending, right? Actually, yeah. Over the next few months, Kim leaves a success life as Mesa Verde's lawyer and as a public defender. She's extraordinarily good at what she does and she's finally happy. She's found meaningful work and can comfortably live and has pretty much stopped all of her schemes. That is, until Jimmy messes it up. The thing about Jimmy is that much like Kim, he can't stop himself from cutting corners. He can't play by the rules. It's all he's ever done and it's what he continues to do. So of course, during his hiatus from lawyering, he starts to illegally sell phones to customers. Huel Babineau, quite possibly the most complex character in the entire Breaking Bad universe, and maybe even television gets arrested, and Jimmy asks Kim for help to get him out. She helps him fake hundreds of letters proving Hill's good nature and innocence, then she assembles a team of three other lawyers to intimidate the assistant Albuquerque DA and essentially convince her that Hill's case isn't worth her time. And those letters, they get to the judge overseeing the case. He's clearly pissed off at the hundreds of letters he's received and the DA is justifiably furious. She reads a few letters and finds a number written on one. First, she leaves a voicemail, but then she calls a second phone, and of course, Jimmy is waiting on the other end. 
Kimin. He feeds the DA a fake story, even going as far to create a website to prove Huel's good nature. Kim and Jimmy set up and execute this elaborate plot to keep Huel out of jail, and they con the entire DA's office just to defend Huel. The DA realizes that pursuing or prosecution of Huel is a waste of time, and directly after that, well, yeah. Once again, phenomenal foreshadowing and characterization. Kim and Jimmy get off on their cons. Her very first scam was followed by what was the start of Kim and Jimmy's true relationship, and after her most recent con, she celebrates. Then, just a day after freeing Huel, Kim asked Jimmy to con someone again, so they forge documents to help Mesa Verde build a new bank even quicker. Kim runs two successful scams in a row, but again, this is Kim. She's not pure evil, she just has hints of it. She doesn't want to be another Saul, she wants to help people. So when Mesa Verde is about to remove and demolish Mr. Acker's home, Kim does her best to help him. She offers alternative homes, even trying to convince Kevin to build the bank in a different location. But when all of that falls through, Kim plans another con. Jimmy gets his license back and represents Mr. Acker. He causes delay after delay, and they plan to make a fake commercial to tarnish Mesa Verde's reputation, but Kim decides to pull the plug. She realizes this isn't why she got into the law, and that her schemes are hurting others. So she pulls the plug on the scheme and agrees to relocate Mr. Acker. But Jimmy, he's committed to the scheme. He goes behind Kim's back, blackmailing Mesa Verde with the commercial, and then threatens to sue Mesa Verde for their logo. All the while, Kim is arguing with Jimmy, almost screaming at him in anger. Jimmy went behind her back and betrayed her trust, and in response to Jimmy completely backstabbing Kim, she offers to marry him. Again and again, scheme after scheme, Kim proves her hidden evil. She protects herself and Jimmy time after time following their schemes that have not only hurt people, but ruined them. She marries Jimmy so that if they're ever caught, they wouldn't have to testify against one another, which means they can scheme as much as they want. And Jimmy further transforms into Saul. He agrees to not only work for Lalo and the cartel, but to even collect their money. He gathers $7 million from the Salamancas to get Lalo out on bail, but is ambushed on his drive back home from the desert. Mike saves him, but in the process, every car is destroyed. This leads to both of them spending days in the desert trying to survive their walk back to civilization. But before Jimmy left, he told Kim that he'd be representing Lalo. You'd imagine a reaction of shock or even disgust from Kim, but she tells Jimmy, I'm glad you did, and kisses him. So when Jimmy's stranded in the desert, Kim confronts Lalo, demanding to know where he is. Of course, he doesn't know, but Kim meeting with Lalo furthers her involvement in the game. Jimmy returns with a bullet hole in his world's second greatest lawyer mug, and Kim confronts him about it. He deflects the truth, but Kim is still completely okay with it. She's obviously flustered with fear and love for Jimmy, but she is still almost completely okay with Jimmy being a friend of the cartel. She then quits Schweigert and Coakley for her pro bono cases to chase the fulfillment and happiness she'd felt earlier in the show. But as she's telling Jimmy that she quit Mesa Verde, Lalo steps in. He wants to know what really happened in the desert. Lalo gets closer to Jimmy. He takes a more threatening stance, demanding to know what happened, and Kim comes to Jimmy's defense. He goes to protect Jimmy. She goes to clean up Jimmy's mess. She successfully gets Lalo to back off and leave. Now, any normal person would have either left Jimmy at this point, or at least put a stop to their schemes to try and get out of the game. But not Kim. She doubles down on her marriage with Jimmy and her hatred for Howard. And Kim's hatred for Howard has been growing throughout the entirety of the show. When Howard and Kim talk, Howard tells Kim that there's something wrong with Jimmy. He threw bowling balls at his car and sent prostitutes to his lunch. And Kim, she doesn't care. In fact, she finds it funny. Howard says there's something wrong with Jimmy, and he insinuates that Kim quitting Mesa Verde must have had something to do with Jimmy. And this was unforgivable for Kim. In this moment, she essentially agrees to the scheme that killed Howard Hamlin. She begins her plan to ruin Howard. First, Jimmy plants Sniffy Dust in Howard's locker, and then Kim threatens the Kettleman's. Then Jimmy pretends to be Howard and throws a Lady of the Night out of his car while Kim is meeting with Cliff. Of course, Cliff sees this and believes it to be Howard, but in her meeting with Cliff, he gives Kim an offer to do some real good. He offers to start a project that would truly help a lot of people, and Kim agrees to it. Next, Kim and Jimmy fake photographs with a retired judge overseeing the Sandpiper meeting between HHM and Schweikert and Coakley. But the same day Kim is set up to go ahead with her project, Jimmy sees the judge and that his arm is in a sling. This renders the pictures they've already taken useless, and Jimmy tells Kim they can't follow through with the plan. But Kim isn't about to quit, so she bails on the lunch that would set up her project to help a ton of people just to fake pictures to ruin Howard, once again revealing a hidden evil within herself. And as Howard's entire career and reputation is ruined, we once again see Kim and Jimmy celebrating their successful plot. It becomes clear why they scheme with each other, not necessarily for the benefit of others and not even to benefit themselves. They do it because it's fun, they get off on it, they enjoy it, and at this point, Kim and Saul have completely lost their morality. So when Howard shows up in Kim and Jimmy's apartment, demanding an answer as to why his life was ruined, they can't give one. There's no reasonable answer to give, and Howard figures this out. They didn't do it for the money, they didn't do it out of hate, and they didn't even do it for their careers. They simply just enjoy conning people, and for some sick, twisted reason, they get off on it. And as Lala walks in behind Howard, the true consequences of their scheme reveals itself. The consequences of Kim's nature reveals itself. Kim Wexler's hidden evil fully 
fully reveals itself. Howard Hamlin is killed, and Kim Wetzler is responsible for it. Kim pushed the scheme to the extreme that it went. Kim pushed Jimmy to continue the scheme even when Jimmy was ready to call it off. Howard tells Kim that she has a piece missing and in its most literal sense, Howard is referencing a missing chess piece. But if we look deeper than that, Howard is referring to Kim. Kim is a piece missing. Kim has something wrong with her. Jimmy was born into his life of schemes, but Kim chose it. She chose to ruin Howard and she caused Howard's death. Kim Wexler killed Howard Hamlin and she's justifiably overwhelmed. Her and Jimmy's scheme was the catalyst of Howard's death, so she runs. She runs with the story that Howard was an addict, telling the same story at his remembrance and even to his wife. She allows everyone to believe that Howard Hamlin died an addict and then she breaks up with Jimmy. She finally realizes that her and Jimmy's relationship is poison for everyone around them. They scheme for fun, they sabotage for fun, and while Kim enjoyed herself, she was ruining other people's lives. Kim isn't pure evil, she just has a hidden evil. She's clearly not a good person, but she's not a villain. She didn't mean for Howard to die, but she did mean to ruin him. Kim finally recognizes herself. She sees her and Jimmy's relationship for what it is, and she understands what she needs to do. So, Kim runs away. She runs from Jimmy, from Howard's death, from her schemes and involvement in the cartel. She runs from her job, her responsibilities, and her work. She runs from herself, suppressing her independent, strong-willed nature, and now allows others to control her life. Kim divorces Jimmy and runs to Florida, leaving herself behind. And for six years, Kim remains hidden. She updates the Palm Coast Sprinkler catalog, making small talk with her colleagues throughout her daily life. Of course, she goes above and beyond doing research and even learning pipe jargon, but she lives a simple life. Her relationship with the Yup guy shows the unordinary yet comfortable monotony of Kim's everyday life. For six years, Kim suppresses her past. She hides it, trying her best to completely forget about her relationship with Jimmy and what happened to Howard. For six years, Kim runs from herself, abandoning her independence, allowing others to control her. For six years, Kim Wexler is dead. That is, until she receives a call from Jimmy. Throughout those six years, Kim hadn't heard a word from him. The only thing she'd seen was Saul Goodman. The Saul Goodman who helped a drug lord become a kingpin. The Saul Goodman who'd been involved in the deaths of hundreds. So when Saul calls Kim, she breaks. She tells Saul to turn himself in, and he tells her to do the same. Obviously, Jimmy doesn't, but Kim comes back. She can't keep hiding anymore. She can't suppress her feelings anymore. So the feelings she'd suppressed for nearly six years finally come out. Kim goes back to Albuquerque. She comes clean about Howard's death and all of her schemes. She comes clean to Cheryl, Howard's wife. She comes clean to the public, and she comes clean to herself. She writes a confession and allows Cheryl to do whatever she wants with it, finally revealing how and why Howard died. When Saul gets arrested, he's able to get his sentence down to seven years. Seven short years in a California prison where he gets ice cream every week. But when he's made aware of Kim's confession, he changes his mind. Jimmy, throughout his entire life, has always done anything for Kim. So when Kim confesses, Saul realizes that he needs to as well. So when he takes the stand, we watch him do something rare. He accepts responsibility, he accepts the blame, and he accepts the consequences, and he does it all for Kim. Jimmy McGill comes back. He'd rather be able to look Kim in the eye knowing he did the right thing than get out of prison in 7 years and remain alone. So he's sentenced to 86 years. Kim and Jimmy share one last cigarette. Illegal in a prison, but this is Kim and Jimmy. They still need to have a little fun. And finally, as Kim leaves Jimmy's prison, remembering their time together, she and Jimmy share one last moment. Both face the consequences consequences of their actions. Both are stuck in an eternal prison for their crimes, but both are finally alive and finally at peace. Now, make no mistake, Kim and Jimmy do not redeem themselves. They could never atone for their terrible crimes they committed, and they could never make them right. Together, both of them ruined so much, they destroyed so much, they poisoned so much. Finale isn't redemption for either of them, it's just acceptance. Acceptance of their actions and acceptance of the consequences. Kim could never fix the hurt she's caused. She can never get rid of her hidden evil. It'll always be there, and we saw its effects throughout the entirety of Better Call Saul. Kim is without a doubt one of the most well-written characters in television history, and and one of my personal favorites. She's not a black and white character, and she's not a good person. And still, most of us love her. Most of us root for her. Despite her hidden evil, we still root for Kim Wexler. And maybe that's indicative of our relatability to Kim and her flaws. Nevertheless, Kim Wexler is without a doubt Better Call Saul's hidden evil. I have to thank you guys for the support on my two most recent videos. In just two weeks, they've become my two most viewed videos, so thank you guys so much, truly. 
and apparently my mic was too loud last video so I'm excited to announce that with the ad revenue for my last two videos I was able to purchase a new mic for myself and that is all because of you guys. I've loved making these Better Call Saul videos and even more I've loved interacting with you guys which leads me to my next point. This might be my last Better Call Saul video, at least for a while. I know a lot of you are likely here for Better Call Saul and the support you've shown has been truly incredible but I don't want to be limited to just one show or topic so thank you guys for watching these videos and if you're just here for Better Call Saul then thank you for checking out my channel and I'd love to see you in my future videos. Let me know what you guys would like to see videos on and thank you for supporting me. I'll likely be dropping one last Better Call Saul video before the year ends, a sort of ultimate analysis and I might even return to the show later but for now I've said everything I've wanted to say so thank you guys so much for watching and I can't wait to see you guys in my next videos. And according to my analytics 99.5% of you guys are not subscribed so I'd really appreciate if you could and if you enjoyed remember to like but for now I've said everything I've wanted to say so thank you guys for watching and I can't wait to see you guys in my next videos. Peace.